Prince of Persia Warrior Within as the second game in Ubisoft's line of fantasy titles and released in late 2004 on the PC, Xbox, PS2, and GameCube. Fine, fine, okay, I'm going, I'm, I'm going. There's obviously more to it than that, as Warrior Within is certainly the most infamous of the franchise in more ways than one, and yeah, I have opinions on it, as you could imagine. When the sales numbers for Sands of Time came out, like mentioned in the last episode, Ubi was underwhelmed with how it performed versus its critical praise. So, obviously, radical steps were taken to try and make a sequel more marketable in line with where the video game industry was headed at this time. And that, of course, includes tribal tattoos, blood and gore, giant metal thongs stuck up people's asses, god smack. So yeah, that's, 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 that's what they did. But the genesis of Warrior Within was a bit more complicated than just all of that. Despite the sales numbers, Ubisoft still wanted to push a sequel, and that's when Sands of Time director Patrice de Soleil comes in. He fantasized about a pop title that took the focus away from the prince as a playable character, instead making him a mystical figure that needed protection, protection by his entourage of trained assassins. His bosses, however, felt this idea was too far removed from the source material in and wanted a sequel to remain focused on the prince, so his idea was instead just moved away to become a different franchise altogether, which we'll get to another time. Patrice moved on, and instead a different team handled the majority of Warrior Within, as a lot of the core Sands of Time crew were also shifted onto that new project. The other noticeable omission is Jordan Mechner, who had no involvement with the franchise from here on out. So you can tell, with all these departures and team changes, it's no surprise Warrior Within turned out the way it did. So let's just get right into it. The Prince is now a grizzled and on-the-run vagabond who has spent the last 10 years of his life running away from the Dahaka, a god-beast creature whose job it is to extinguish any irregularities in the flow of time. And as it so happens, the Prince is one of these irregularities in the flow of time. Whosoever shall open the sands must Die. He should have died at the end of Sands, but because his cleverness is like, I guess, a slap in the face to Father Time, the Dahaka is always in pursuit. He then decides the only way to get the Dahaka off his dick is to travel to the Island of Time and, and scream at its mistress, the um, Empress of Time. It's a perilous journey, as his boat is attacked by a mysteriously, ridiculously clad female character by the name of Shadi, who is nothing more than an irritating thorn in the prince's side and never really amounts to anything important in the story. As it stands, I actually think this is a cool setup for a sequel. It's just that they went way, 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 way overboard with just about everything else. The game now has a dreary, dark art style, even more desaturated than God of War. Copious amounts of blood spurts from just about everything you hit. Metal-infused guitars now permeate every song in the game. The script is now far more basic, classless, and crude. You will never reach our shores alive. For your sake, you better hope I don't. It couldn't be further from Sands of Time's tone and atmosphere. This is a real shame, however, because in many ways, Worry Within improves on Sands of Time in a lot of key areas. It's just that these key areas are few and far between, and the try-hard edginess of the game is a constant, overpowering stink cloud that hangs above everything else. Still though, I think it's only fair to explore those improved aspects to actually give Warrior Within its due. Combat has now been greatly expanded upon and carries the ludicrous moniker of the Free Form Fighting System, which is a fancy way of saying you got more moves now. The Prince can dual wield weapons or go single handed and this changes his moveset. He can now grapple, throw, and execute his enemies in a variety of ways. 
That last bit is really important because fleeing an enemy in a specific direction is a key component of combat you'll want to master because it'll result in them plummeting to their doom as there always seems to be a hole or a cliff nearby. This then speeds up enemy encounters immensely, which ain't no bad thing and at least leads to more variety in the battles than Sands of Time could ever offer. You also fight less repeating ways of enemies and don't need to rely on the dagger anymore, which is also, in my eyes, a positive thing. Not to mention, there's a larger bestiary of different enemies to fight and even a few boss fights sprinkled throughout. Reaper also... The, the Prince also enjoys increased environmental interaction. He can swing around posts, flailing his sword around like an upset teenager. He can shred banners and fabrics while repelling down them, which is still awesome to do to this day. The environments also lead themselves to more secrets. Scattered throughout the island are treasure chests you can bust open to unlock concept art. While this is kind of blasé by today's standards, back in 2004, this at least gave you something to do rather than smash all the worthless empty pots and sands. Another good job sticker for you, Warrior Within! The game is also a bit more freeform in how it approaches progression. You have a few central hub type areas on the island of clocks and can pick and choose which part of the castle you want to tackle. I mean, look at this map! Look, look! Look how great this map is! It, hel it helps you go wherever you need to. You can traverse these areas in two distinct time periods. You'll often have to solve platforming puzzles by switching between both eras, where bridges were once shattered and useless, they're pristine and functional in the past. All this further time fuckery goes a long way into pissing off the Dehaka even more, and that's another key thing. The game has given the Prince a proper threat that seems unbeatable, and, and coupled with those few boss fights I mentioned, makes a more satisfying enemy force to conquer than the Vizier and his handful of different sand goons. Now we come to the music. Honestly, while Godsmack and the Funky Bunch is what usually springs to mind when one thinks of the Warrior Within soundscape, the actual OST, while featuring more guitar work, is still pretty good. Sands of Time did feature guitars as well, so it doesn't feel that out of place. Yeah, it's heavier sounding overall, but it still has enough Middle Eastern influences to keep it fresh. An acoustic version of I Stand Alone accompanies every Dahaka chase, and you also get a guilty pleasure every time it ramps up. Aside from the end credits usage of straight out of line, Godsmack was mostly used in the marketing of Warrior Within, and it doesn't really sully the actual game's auditory flavor. And yeah, those are the positives for Warrior Within. Unfortunately, aside from the dramatic tonal shift, there's a slew of other problems with the game that still slog it down into being inferior to most of Ubi's Persian-related output. First and foremost, with only a year turnaround time, is it a surprise that the game is a buggy mess? When it launched, I encountered a multitude of issues throughout my playthrough. Some switches would just not function unless you quit and rebooted your save. I would fall through the floor fairly regularly, and most epic of all, Hours before story events triggered it, I booted up my save one day, only to see I had been transformed into the prince's Sandwraith form. This form was never intended to be used in this part of the game I was in, and would result in a myriad of other issues. The fighting is expanded, yes, but unfortunately they also decided to give many enemies annoying taunts and quips, which they love repeating. Over and over and over and over again. Is this a bug? I can't tell. Now, while the illusion of more environmental variety is there, the art direction of the game makes everything look very samey. 
It all just feels like dark, dripping dungeons with no particular area having much of an identity. And finally, one of my last and maybe biggest gripes is the script and voice acting. Not only do subtitles often not match the acting, with some subs completely missing altogether, but the performances here are simply not as entertaining as they were in the previous game. Oh, don't you know? The language used is just kind of basic, with no real panache in the script. Everyone is just yeah, tired and angry, and they just scream at each other for the most part. The Empress meets with no one. Who do you think you are? I am the Prince of Persia. When you break it down, there's only three main characters. The Prince, uh, Steel Thonger, and the Empress of Time, played by Monica Bellucci. Well, sometimes she's played by her. Ms. Bellucci must have been an expensive hire, as she only seemingly does every other line before being replaced by an obvious sound alike. Now, Kylina is a very superficial character, with about the depth of a kiddie pool, not a patch on Ferris' shoulders, and her relationship with the prince is so forced and contrived, lacking all the earnest sentiments and charm of the prince and Ferris' journey. It's just, it's just kind of a complete waste. While we're on the subject of voice acting, however, I gotta say, I love me some Robin Atkins Downs any fucking day of the week, but his performance of the prince just doesn't resonate. There was no reason not to keep Yuri, just have him gruff it up a bit. I mean, why change actors? The character isn't like 40 years older, it's only been a fucking decade! All of this is leading up to one of the game's most fatal flaws. With the advent of a more open structure, Ubisoft felt the need to tie in two possible endings that are dependent on collecting all the life upgrade power-ups. These were optional in Sands of Time, but are now inexplicably linked with you getting good end or bad end. On its own, this isn't a bad idea, because if you have a game that follows a looser structure, just go around and get those last few collectibles before the last boss fight, right? No? No, not, not really. Well, before you have your final showdown with the Tahaka, you can certainly attempt to gain those last few upgrades, but you better have multiple saves because one of those upgrades is locked in a spot that has no route back to get to the central area where you need to finish the game. You are locked the fuck out. There's a lot of variants onto this bug, and one of them happened to me. What's more is that the game never actually tells you you need to get all life upgrades for a good ending in the first place. Like I said, they were optional in the last one. Why why start doing this now? Just <sighs> And Ubisoft knew they fucked up because Warrior Within sequel, The Two Thrones, basically starts by saying some people think this happened to the prince on the island of time, but those people are stupid idiots who didn't collect all the life upgrades, so, so fuck whatever you did last time, here's the real story. And it assumes you got the good ending because of reasons. Like, did they not see this coming? I'm all up for multiple endings, but if you're gonna make a sequel to a game, with multiple endings, at least plan more than not at all. Like, damn. Finally, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Prince of Persia Revelations, which is the PSP version of Warrior Within, essentially, but it has 27% more revelations. There's not much new here, but it does perform well on the PSP, all things considered, and does feature several new areas that are exclusive to it, but are also horrible. You'll always know in one of these new sections because they'll almost always just be big featureless grey rooms kind of semi-connected together that I'm already struggling to remember. But if you need your warrior within action on the go, or your Liam, then this is uh, this is certainly the version to get. It's pretty good. 
Warrior Within actually went on to sell less overall than Sands of Time would eventually go on to do so, but it was still encouraging enough to push Ubisoft on to complete the fabled Sands of Time trilogy. While yeah, they went hard on the atmospheric and tonal change on Warrior, they at least knew it was a misstep, because in the Two Thrones, they would rein it all back in. But we'll delve into that and more next time on...